Jeff, Mark Llewellyn from Channel 9. What? Can I just have a quick chat to you? Now on Murder, Lies and Alibis, answers to one of Australia's greatest unsolved murders. They knew they could solve it. Lies exposed. Obsessed with her. Alibis destroyed. Finish it. Prime suspects confronted. I'd love to talk to you. And a killer oh, named. No deal. The mystery of what happened to teenage beauty queen Bronwyn Richardson uncovered. Justice for Bronwyn. Justice for Bronwyn. So don't hound me about it. I told you, I've had nothing ever to do with the murder of her. You know, I never done it. Can't you realise that? Right? I'm not the type of person that would go around killing my own cousin. Colin Michael Newey has never given an interview before. He claims he's an innocent man. The police believe otherwise. They believe he led the frenzied attack on Bronwyn. And they allege that his sexual obsession with her was the reason. Colin, come over, take a seat, mate. <coughs> this would be an interview like no other. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. How are you placed? Not guilty. <laughs> Watching and prompting critical questions throughout was forensic criminologist Dr. Xanthi Mallet. Waiting to confront him, Darren Hinch. And set up and ready, the lie detector. Knew he claims he wants to take. You know, it's a big deal for you to come and talk today. You're either the man guilty of an awful crime or an innocent man who's being framed for something he didn't do. Today is about telling the truth. One of the things you've done is write, put me on a lie machine, I'll take it. Yeah, you got one? I'll sit here and take it. I'll get nothing to hide. It's going to be really interesting. What happens when that is presented to him as an option later, we'll see whether he means it or not. Can I show you something? Yes. Who do you see? Bronwyn Richardson. As a cousin, yeah, a top girl, you know, like... She didn't deserve to die like that. Did you kill her? No, I never had nothing to do with it. I wasn't anywhere in the town. Because what you face right now is the fact that to the police, you are the prime suspect in the rape, abduction and murder of Bronwyn Richardson. I, with, with all my heart, believe that Colin Newey is the one that knows truly who killed Bronwyn and the circumstances in which she died because he was there. He was there. Just before 17-year-old Bronwyn was snatched off Smollett Street in Albury, eyewitnesses heard her recognise at least one of her abductors. Oh, it's you. In the car. For many years, police thought the, the person car. she recognised was her ex-boyfriend, Jeff Brown. It would be nearly four decades before they dramatically changed their minds and zeroed in on someone else. Someone Bronwyn also knew very well. Colin Michael Newey. Colin, stop! My oh, bitch! Time is now 10.10am 10, 10 on Wednesday, the 30th of July, 2014. 
What was it like the day they came to arrest you? Terrible. Just approaching the front door now. Hello? It's the police here. They knocked on the door. And Mr. Muncho, detective, thought he was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Colin Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here to arrest you for the murder of Bronwyn Richardson. I said, you're an idiot, mate. You are now under arrest for the murder of Bronwyn and Richardson. Oh, oh bullshit. At Albury in 1973. Oh, bullshit. And you're Newey is Bronwyn's one. second cousin. Oh, I've never fucking murdered no one. He is one of the last people to see Bronwyn alive. And the man detectives continue to believe was the ringleader that night. Too, so. Newey is a career really criminal a with a long car. record and several prison sentences. You're right. This is bullshit. Oh, so is this right. is I have fucking this, bull. What, this what, what to brings you to Colin, the conclusion? His offences include theft, burglary, assault, arson, breaching bail, Mr. and Mr. drug Mr. manufacture. You have been arrested on a warrant. Newey knew Bronwyn. He saw her that day. He was in the company of at least one of the other killers and, as you'll learn, his alibi is highly suspicious. When he became the number one suspect and every piece of the puzzle fitted together, an incredible weight was just lifted. But in 2015, the New South Wales Director of Public Prosecutions made a controversial decision that bewildered the police and infuriated Bronwyn's family. Before Newey could be cross-examined, the charges against him were dropped. He never had to enter a plea and never faced a trial. Why was it so important that Colin Newey go to trial? Because the circumstantial evidence around his involvement is overwhelming. Colin Newey returned to Murray Bridge in South Australia free, but still a suspect. Since then, he's rarely left his house and has no contact with his seven children who no longer speak to him. Perhaps his only supporter is Angela, his longtime carer. I'm the one that basically does everything. And why doesn't Colin go out? He's, he's just, um, what's the word? He's, he's just um, too, too afraid. Um, because of all what's happened, he's just afraid to go out in public in case um, uh, people say things or in case he gets bashed. He's innocent. He's not like what people say, so... Um, and I'll, yeah, stand by him. Shouldn't even be a suspect. The only crime I committed was talking to her at midday. That day? That day. On the day Bronwyn died, she visited Peter Newey, Colin's brother, in Albury Hospital. You saw her on the day. It's your concern that your brother was somehow involved? Yes. Peter was being discharged after weeks of treatment for a badly broken leg. And Colin was meant to pick him Show up. Show you. You'd had a bad accident. Yes, motorbike accident. You needed your brother to pick you up? Yes. Did he turn up? No. He was crook. Busted leg. You were supposed to be there at midday. He waited. You never turned up. He found that unusual. He told the police that. Well, I was very slack in keeping time back then. I never wore a watch. Was he dirty about that? <laughs> well, uh... <coughs> <coughs> yeah, he was a bit shitty. Do you believe he was there that day? The day? She was nailed it. Yep. I know I would like to know if he was involved. The thing is, what gets me is where he was that day, she went missing. What was he doing? He was supposed to come and pick. He was supposed to... <clears throat> he 
he was supposed to come and pick me up that day. Why didn't he come? Why didn't he come and see me? Do you know what he was doing at that time? No, no. Yeah, at that time, he was meeting Bronwyn. <sighs> Colin Newey has told multiple versions of what he did and where he was on October the 12th, 1973, when, by his own admission, he was one of the last people to speak to Bronwyn. His story changes and he needs to account for that. This is critical, the day. This is the bit that everyone's going to want to know because it's the most critical well, day in your I, life. I, well, I was in Cole's cafeteria. Hey, Ronnie. Hey. We were sitting there. It was around the midday mark. And then uh, Bronwyn came in. What time are you not going? Uh, around six. Cool. Yeah, so I'll see you around. See you around. After the lunch, did you make arrangements to see Bronwyn again that day? Um, I said to her, oh, well, I'll catch up with you after work. I would just push him on that because his eyes have keep dropping down, so... so... So tell me that again. You said that you made that arrangement with Bronwyn to see her after work? No, well, something to that effect. Was it a date? No, it wasn't a date. He's too direct. It's almost like he's telling you what you want to hear or what you should say, as opposed to thinking about what he actually witnessed that day. She stood you up? No. See, there's no accessing of any memory. So to me, it looks like his brain is doing something different. He's, he's not thinking about what he saw that day. He's, he's saying almost a rehearsed, Speech. You never saw her arrive? No. You never saw her walk down the street, past cars? No. So you didn't see Bronwyn again that night? No, no. I never seen Bronwyn after t about 12.30. But you previously said to the police that you did? No. What time of day was it that you say you last saw Bronwyn crossing? Was I, well, I reckon it was in, in the afternoon, probably around about four or five o'clock or something like that. No, oh, I said, do you want to go out for a meal? All right, and I think she said, no, I'm going dancing. And then we just finished our conversation and I went that way and she went that way. Was she walking towards anything? Oh, well, she was walking across the road to, to where the church was to meet someone. This puts Newey in Smollett Street just before Bronwyn's abduction. I believe you were there at Small Street when she went into the car. No, I seen her walking away. See, what I think, Colin, is that you wanted to take Bronwyn out for tea. Well, I wouldn't have offered it if I didn't yeah. want to take her out for tea, and it was only a social tea. And, I, and you know what? I think she's done the wrong thing by you. She's snubbed you, or she's, she's wiped you. Put your evidence together, because at the moment, you've got bloody nothing. You're trying to accuse me of having something to do about her murder. Yeah. Yeah. Play it, man. Play it. Why would I kill her? Why would I kill her? The reason people really? say you would, would kill her is that you were obsessed with her, that you wanted oh, her, people... and on that day she'd rejected you and that you were upset by this, and you had this jealous rage. Yeah! Stay still! Yeah! Bronwyn Richardson died in 1973, but it would be 41 years before her second cousin was arrested and charged with her murder. Oh, I've never fucking murdered no one. This is bullshit. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is I have fucking bullshit. Yet as far back as 1976, police were given critical information about Colin Michael Newey. He was serving a short jail sentence when a fellow inmate called Harry Poitavan tipped them off. Harry tells the police, I've met a man who told me that he was the boyfriend of the girl murdered in Albury. You told another inmate, Harry Poitavan, that he used to go out with a girl in Albury. 
and that you were supposed to take her out on the night that she was murdered. He says, from the conversation appeared that the man knew a lot about the murder. Yeah, but what name? Who's the man? It's you. You had told Harry Poitivan that he used to go out with a girl in Albury and that she had been murdered the night that you were supposed to take her out. Well, it could have been anyone Poitivan talked to. Yeah, he's starting to get pretty heated now. He's leaning forward, the pointing. There's no name there. This line of questioning, was he the guy involved? Was he the guy named? Or why did the police come and speak to him? Where? Where's my name there? Winding him up. Well, you're the one. No, you know he's talking about you. And the police then go and question you. And they ask you, when had you last seen Bromwell? You said that you hadn't seen her for more than a week before her death. You didn't mention that you'd actually seen her on the day of her disappearance, on the Friday, on the, the 12th of October. I don't know why I didn't mention her. I don't know. I've got no answer to that one. So the first time the police ask you, you tell them an untruth. Hmm? Don't know. Hold it down. The frenzied assault on Bronwyn and the extreme sexual violence she suffered suggests that for at least one of her attackers, the motive was personal. You know, she was left um, naked from the waist down. It was very violent and invasive, the attack. Yeah, certainly, I would think, at least one very dominant, aggressive individual who wanted to denigrate the victim. And what motive is there for denigrating Bronwyn? Well, if it's p personal, then it could be sexual jealousy, rage, you know, if she has rejected them. And you know what? I think she's done the wrong thing by you. She's snubbed you, or she's... she's wiped you. Did you fancy her? No. No, no, no. no. She was just a cousin. She was a cousin. Um, as, a, as a friend. When you talk about Bronwyn, that's when he's most uncomfortable. So anything to do with her when he saw her, how he felt about her. You didn't fancy her romantically? No, no, no. People have said, people like have said. Like a sister. Like a sister. Yeah. I would say she was a bit of a tarky type, you know? Yeah. I respected Bronwyn as a, as a person. I gave her the respect she, what they required, anyone, you know? See, see again here, he's talking about Bronwyn again here. And again, the, he stopped using his hands, he stopped looking around, it's very much direct, so he's responding very differently to the types of questions. Anything to do with Bronwyn is making him really uncomfortable. Did you love no, her? No, no, not love as in love. What sort of love? Um, friend love, like, uh, cat, like brother and sister. Do you feel sad for her mum and dad? Well, I'm sad that Uncle Stan's going to the grave thinking that I killed her. Hello, Colin. This is Uncle Stan pleading with you to do the right thing by Ronnie's death and tell the police what you really know. I wonder if there's part of you that actually wants to, to settle the ledger here and tell them what really happened that night. Mate, it's too late to try and settle a ledger when, when my uncle goes to the grave thinking I was the one that killed his daughter. I'm over 80, going on 85, and in ill health. And I, I, I would like to see Bronnie's case cleared up. So would you please, please do the right thing and tell the police whatever you know about Bronnie's death. Thanks, Colin. Try to do the best you can. If Colin knew he was the ringleader that night, did the probable presence in the car of a teenage thug called Max Martin trigger a rapid and violent escalation? What may have started off as one thing... Became something much worse. ...snowballed to something, something very, very big. So if he was in the car with Max Martin, I can understand the panic and him driving off. I can understand that perhaps being young, he was then caught up in a situation with someone who 
had just been out of prison that same day. So around lunchtime, Max Martin arrives at the train station after being released from prison that day. He doesn't head straight to the pub. Instead, he goes off to the hospital to see his friend. And also, he's down in town, and he actually sees Bronwyn in the Coles Cafe at some point in that afternoon. So he sees her? Yes. In the cafe that lunchtime, when Bronwyn walks in, is 18-year-old Max Martin and 20-year-old Colin Newey. I think I'd seen Max Martin there, and I'd seen Bronwyn. They were in Coles when she was working in Coles. He went to see her for lunch. Yeah. This is Max. He just got out of prison. Hey, Max. So they knew what time she was leaving work. They knew that she was being picked up. What sort of person was Max Martin? Uh, he had that shiftiness in him, you know, like he sort of looked evil. Well, he wasn't a nice person. <laughs> I mean, he was he allegedly committed rapes, allegedly a pedophile. Um, and many believe he was the person that strangled Bronwyn that night. In 1995, Max Martin died violently himself. He was caught bashing a woman. And during the fight that followed, he fell off a motel balcony to his death. Five years earlier, when questioned by detectives, he denied being anywhere near Albury when Bronwyn was taken, and police let him go. It was only after his death that they discovered he was there that day. So was he the co-conspirator who egged the ringleader on, who also raped Bronwyn and helped to kill her? Or was it someone else? Everything I say will be the truth. What was said to me definitely was said to me. If it was my daughter, I definitely want closer. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah, good to meet you. Come on in. Len Pendrick has a secret he has to tell before it's too late. Can I sit here for a minute? Yeah, you okay? Bit of for Sam. Yeah, just let me catch me breath. It's a very big deal that you've decided to speak. You know who the killer is? Yes. Yes. Len knew Max Martin. Len's best friend was Max's late brother, Terry. Some years after Bronwyn's murder, he and Terry heard a news report about her case. And what happened next is etched in Len's memory. I asked him about it, and his words was, I know he'd done it. And I said, how do you know he done it? He said, he told me because he was very scared. And um, he moved to South Australia. Max did. Murray Bridge? Yes. He moved to Murray Bridge? Yes. He moved to Murray Bridge. Is it mere coincidence, or something more sinister, that several police persons of interest in Bronwyn's murder all left Albury to live in Murray Bridge, including Colin Newey and Max Martin? Do you have any doubt that he was capable of killing somebody? No. None? Why? No doubt. I believe he killed her because he had to. He had to kill She knew him all. She'd seen his face. And so he had to kill her. Were you there as Max Martin put his hands around her neck and strangled her to death? Nah. In her last moments, did she beg you for help? No, I wasn't there. I'm innocent. <clears throat> Do you remember what you did in the morning of that day? Detectives had repeatedly pressured Colin Newey about his alibi leading up to Bronwyn's murder. Oh, I think I went to... Uh... Oh, I've got to go to the toilet. Can I go to the toilet? Yeah, yes, certainly. This would not be the first or the last time that Colin Newey would be caught short during police questioning. After his toilet break, detectives got straight to the point. I'm saying that you were there when Bronwyn was taken off Smollett Street. No, I wasn't. 
No, I wasn't. I didn't know nothing about her being pinched until the Sunday when my uncle Wes come and picked me up from the army barracks. In 1973, Colin Newey was a member of what is now known as the Army Reserve. What did you actually do on the bivouac? Oh, went out, <laughs> went out and played cowboys. And this is Newey's alibi. That on the night of his cousin's murder, he'd already left town to take part in weekend war games with 30 other part-time soldiers. He says he was on an Army bivouac. There was no record of any bivouac. He's told police that he couldn't have been anywhere near where a Bromwell was taken, raped and killed because he went on an army bivouac. That's his alibi. He couldn't have been. He couldn't have been away because he was around at my sister's. Yeah, 100 per cent? Yes. I'm 100 per cent because it was our sister's th birthday, 13th of October. The next day? Yes, Saturday. He was there. You may have got your weekends mixed up. I may have. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of nothing. Not on a bivouac? No. Nope. Not in army uniform? No. Nope. And you can't account for where he was the night before? No. The night that Bromwin disappeared? I can't. The night that Bromwin died? I can't account for it. I've had nothing ever to do with the murder of her. You go and look at Ross Eames. I never done it. In this investigation into Colin Newey, the role of another police person of interest, Ross Eames, is central. Some years after Bronwyn's murder, both Eames and Newey would leave Albury and end up living in the same small town of Murray Bridge in South Australia. He used to drop around in my place quite a lot. Tell me about Ross Eames. All I know is I met him in jail. You weren't friends? No. You were close for a while. Yeah, but just as acquaintances, he's one you'd, I'd never trust. In 1989, Eames and Newey were living just a few hundred metres apart on the night Darren Hinch ran a story about Bronwyn's murder. After 16 years, the best and biggest breakthrough after a special report on this program. The next day, at lunchtime, two phone calls in quick succession were made to the local police station. Ringing about the program on Hinch last night concerning the murder of Bronwyn Richardson in Albury, New South Wales. The detailed information from the anonymous caller about Bronwyn's final moments suggested the caller was there the night Bronwyn died. The suspect they named as a wrong bloke. Police traced the calls to this phone box in Kentor Street. Murray Bridge. So what happened here is that the police say that they traced the call to this one, is that right? To this phone box up here, yeah. And this one this is? This is the phone box, they reckon. So let's go to the phone call, because this is critical. This is the one that becomes of interest to the police. Initially, they think it's Ross Eames. You live 600 metres away, he lives about a kilometre away. That was one of the ones that was there at the time. He names the four people that were with him. There were four of us there. It was this bloke by the name of Kevin Newman. Brownie. Yeah. Well, his surname was Brown. Uh, it was this bloke by the name of Martin. The caller placed four men at the scene of one of Australia's most horrific crimes. But Colin Newey's name wasn't mentioned. It's one of the reasons why he claims he's innocent. Colin Newey has denied that he was there or did anything. Mm. Um, why won't you accept that? Because he made the call in 1990, not what? Ross Eames. So the question is, was it Ross Eames making that call or was it somebody pretending to be him so that the police would look over that direction? Could be. That's your brother. Could I be. Know. Could be your brother. Yeah. And you don't have a second thought thinking that? No. Ross John Eames was 14 years and nine months old when Bronwyn Richardson was killed. The anonymous caller gave a similar age, 
I didn't do anything there. I was, I was only 14 at the time. And when questioned by police in 1990, Eames allegedly admitted he made the calls. But 21 years later, he sensationally changed his story. Ross Eames said on oath in court, in evidence, that you made those phone calls. Not that I can recall. The two men, one town, one call, could have been you or him. <coughs> Wasn't me. Whoever made the phone call from that phone box, the police believed they dropped some information about the age of this man at the time of Bronwyn's disappearance. I didn't do anything, though. I was, I was only 14 at the time. In other words, they deliberately set the police on a path that would lead them to the door of Ross Eames. Five days before a phone call is made from that phone box that we visited, you have a massive falling out. They believe you had the motive to set him up with that phone call. Did you tell no. people that you had made that call? No. Did you do it to set Ross Eames up? No. Did you do it because Ross Eames had dudded you in a business no. deal? No. Did you no. make that phone call? No, I never made no phone call. And I was saying, you know, he's not, he's not uncomfortable with this part of the conversation. You know, he's sticking to his story. If, watching this, I get the sense that he's telling his truth. So, you know, I, I'm not convinced he did make that phone call. Colin, I'd like to play you something now. It's from the Hinch program. And it features uh, the parents of Bronwyn Richardson, including your Uncle Stan. Yeah. Would you watch it for me? Yeah, I'll watch it. Thanks. Please hold that hands. There's nothing more can happen. Nothing more can happen to us. We don't want revenge. I've been to hell. We've been to hell and back. We don't want revenge. We don't want to go to While hell. Colin Newey watched this report, wrong, Darren Hinch was on his way to confront him. Now, Alan Stan Richardson, good evening. Good evening, good evening Darren. Darren. For more than three decades, Hinch followed and reported on the hunt for Bronwyn's killer. For Darren, this story is personal, and he felt he owed it to Stan and Kathleen to challenge their nephew to make good on his promise to take a lie detector, or as Newey calls it, the truth machine. Well, no, it's hard for you. I thank you for your time. I thank you, Darren, for everything. No one has followed that case more closely than Darren Hinch. Mm. Would you like to speak to him? Who? Darren Hinch. Wh where is he? Oh, hello, Mr. Hinch. Hello, Colin. Oh, mate, I've... Oh, I'm extremely well. I'm extremely wow. No. Hello. I didn't think this would happen, did we? No. Now, anything to tell me? You give me a heart attack. <laughs> anything to tell me? Tell you what? About what happened. This wouldn't be a long interview. Darren Hinch right, well, cut this, straight to the chase. You the truth. You've said, and I've written it down here a number of times from the coronial hearings and stuff, I've got the notes, um, that you take a lie detector test, right? Yeah, I'll take a lie detector test. You got one? Yes. Yeah, well, you'll take it now? Set it up. Come with, sit up. Come with me. <laughs> Taking charge of the polygraph test was Elizabeth Martin, who's regarded as Australia's best practitioner. All right, Colin, tell me what you know about the polygraph. Do you know anything about it? No. Have you researched it at all? No. No? Have you heard anything about it? Do you know what it is? Uh, it's a truth machine type, I think. <laughs> well, some people do say that that's what it is, but really it isn't, OK? What it does is when I ask you questions, you and I are talking right now and you're very calm. When I ask you something, if it is something that triggers a significant response in you because it's sensitive, either you were involved or not involved, that's gonna create a response that I'm gonna see. Yeah. If you haven't done any of these things that we're asking you about, there'll be no response. Does that make sense? Yeah. Before the actual test, Newey was first asked a series of control questions. Now, regarding the death of Bronwyn Richardson, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Have you ever been so mad at someone that you wish them dead? On several occasions. Have you ever lied to a person in a position of authority? Yeah. OK, what other times other than those times you told uh, me? When I've been arrested for stupid things. OK, other than that? No. Nah. OK. The test will now begin. 
Sit perfectly still. Listen to my voice and listen to the questions and answer them as asked. Do you understand? Yeah. All right, Colin, here we go. Just make sure you stay facing that way. Don't look at me. And also make sure that you don't move or shake your head while you're answering the questions. The test will now begin. Regarding the death of Bronwyn Richardson, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Are you completely convinced that I will not ask you a question on this test that has not already been reviewed? Yes. But the test was nearly over before it began. Now listen, you need to really understand what I'm saying to you. You must not move during the test, okay? You must stay still. And unfortunately, you'll get no results from this test if you keep doing that. Okay. All right. Did you call the Murray Bridge Police Station on 10 October 1989? No. Did you do anything to Bronwyn Richardson to cause her death? No. Were you present at the time of Bronwyn Richardson's death? No. Okay, the test is over. You can relax. Okay, take these off here. <clears throat> For Colin Michael Newey, this was the moment of truth. For nearly a decade, he's lived his life under suspicion, accused of the worst possible crime. And he was very nervous. Okay, Colin, we have the results of your polygraph test. Yeah. So as you know, we asked you three questions, right? The first question we asked you was, did you call the Murray Bridge Police Station? The second question we asked was, did you do anything to cause the death of Bronwyn Richardson? And the third question was, were you present at the time of Bronwyn Richardson's death? The results of your polygraph are no significant reactions, which means you are non-deceptive and telling the truth. Well, Thank you. So you've passed. Thank you very much. At least I cleared that part. Thank you very much. That's what we've been wanting. You know, it's That's good to be, good to see someone have faith. Thank you. You know, hey. and That's all we've been I'm waiting sorry, on. feel sorry for Uncle Stan. You know, for all these years, yeah. you, know, you sat there saying, I want a polygraph, I want a polygraph, yeah. and you got it. And I finally yeah. got it. I can say I proved right. a point. The thing but the it thing. never proved nothing to Uncle Stan. So Colin Newey, the current police prime now, suspect, feel? passed Terrible, the polygraph. I've cleared my name to my satisfaction, but there'll be still people out there doubting, mm. right? But they've got to realise what you see is not what you get. And there will be doubters. In New South Wales, where Bronwyn's murder happened, lie detector findings are not admissible in court. But if Colin Newey is innocent, then police must re-examine this case with fresh eyes. It was a fuck up from the police and they've already admitted it was a fuck up from the police. What you're about to hear is the only eyewitness account of what allegedly happened at Horseshoe Lagoon the night Bronwyn Richardson died. This is secret audio which has never been made public. In 2007, detectives wired up an informant to record Ross Eames without his knowledge. The children thrown her in the fucking river into the lagoon. Eames was just shy of his 15th birthday when Bronwyn was murdered. In the recording, he admits that he and 18-year-old Kevin Newman watched the brutal sexual assault. We were all young kids, right? And we seen what we thought was just uh, Sheila getting grabbed and buggy, buffed up and raped and everything else. He names two men. Don't know which one done the murder because we left, right? And you had Kevin and me leave. Now, Kevin's dead and one of them are dead. So there's only two left. Jeffrey Charles Brown and Maxwell, Maxie Martin. But not Colin Newey. There was Colin involved in this. Not really, because he wasn't even there. I think Ings is the key to this. He saw at least some of what happened, so I don't know why he would be lying to somebody, you know, who's his friend, doesn't know it's being recorded, but 
is he just a liar? You know, he's told so many versions of this, but I think when it comes down to it, he may be the only person who can tell us what really happened, or at least give us those answers that can lead to the truth. Oh, do you want to have a chat with us? Ross Eames refuses to cooperate with New South Wales detectives still investigating Bronwyn's death and refuse to speak to us. Hey, okay, mate. If you change your mind, mate. Goodbye. That's a polite goodbye. Fair enough. I was just wondering if you had a chance maybe overnight to think about the discussion we had yesterday and whether you'd like to uh, speak with us again. No, I don't want to speak with you again. I told you to piss off then, and I'm telling you to piss off now. I think it would be worth, worthwhile if you did meet us, and I can meet you at the police station, uh, say, at Murray Bridge, at your convenience. Uh, what would you say about that? The plane from Adelaide goes back to Sydney. Get on it. If he has a conscience, now would be the time. Be a man and do what you know you need to do. Finish the... Finish it. As for Jeff Brown, Bronwyn's ex-boyfriend, he has long claimed that Ross Eames is a liar who tried to frame him. Jeff, Mark Llewellyn from Channel 9. What? Can I just have a quick chat no, to you? No, 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 there, there's a reason. Hello. We're doing a documentary. He's always maintained his innocence and has never spoken publicly. I'd like to give you the opportunity to speak. If there's any chance that you could speak, I... I'm out 46 years in this shit. No, that's why I'd love to talk to you, if that's all right. You can do it off the record if you like. There are no proceedings against him. Jeff Brown has never been convicted. Well, you know, we did want to give him the opportunity. He has had 46 years of this. If he's an innocent man, it's the worst thing in the world. It's a case that still resonates with so many people and, of course, clearly the family of Bronwyn Richardson. But his answer there to being offered to speak was go away. all my kids' lives, right? How many other lives do the coppers want to kill? Do their fucking job. They paid to do a job, do it. Instead of falsely accusing people. <laughs> <laughs> 